A 35-year-old man with a unilateral white mature cataract wants a surgery for that eye. He gives history of some vague trauma around the eye about two years back, but he's not sure whether he could correlate the trauma with his drop in vision. We can see these two specks of calcified spots on the anterior capsule. I'm not sure whether this could be considered as an evidence for any trauma. Well, in young patients with unilateral cataract, trauma, uveitis, and topical steroid abuse always need to be considered as these are the most common risk factors for such cataracts. The case does look straightforward and honestly at this point I did not expect anything uh, unusual during the surgery. I begin my rexis. I'm aiming around 5mm sized rexis. I'm careful. I just want to avoid the area of this calcified speck here. I don't aim to do any hydrodissection but I just want to loosen the lens a little bit and want to confirm that the area of the calcified capsule is not holding on to the underlying nucleus. Although there are these marks on the nucleus exactly underneath the area of calcification, I did not read too much into it. I rotated the nucleus and it did rotate effortlessly. So now is the time to FACO and I plan to perform a direct vertical chop. And this is a soft cataract in a young man. So I'm using very little power, just using the vacuum to hold onto the nucleus and then chop it. After dividing the first hemineucleus into smaller fragments, I emulsify the first fragment and then begin chopping at the second hemineucleus. Until now, I am still not found with anything unusual. As soon as I emulsify this large fragment, I notice this unusual long line posterior to the nucleus which is extending all the way up to the equator. Now, this was suspicious. The chopper comes out and I replace uh, with the dispersive OVD before withdrawing the FACO probe. Now is the time to inspect and have a re-look. The nuclear fragments are pushed aside. At the outset, it looks like there is a PC tear underneath these lens fragments, probably a pre-existing one. Dispersive OVD is pushed underneath the fragments and with the cushion of this dispersive OVD, I am continuing with my fake emulsification. The next fragment is emulsified. Now just two more fragments remaining. As I am trying to emulsify this fragment, suddenly there is a deepening of the anterior chamber and this is probably indicative of the rupture of the anterior face. Again, as a rule, I need to remember to put in OVD before pulling out my FACO probe. The dispersive OVD acts like a temporary barrier and also tamponates and it potentially could prevent vitreous prolapse. Now the visibility is good, it is crystal clear, a large PC tear is staring at me. Now my first priority is to prevent the nuclear fragments from dropping down. One fragment is above the rexus and the other fragment is below it. It is gently manipulated anteriorly above the rexus margin. At this point, I am contemplating should I put in the lens uh, to use it as a scaffold and then fake these fragments. On the contrary, I thought that since these are very small and soft fragments, I decided to extend the incision just a little bit and express them out manually. I am using viscoelastic to express them out manually. I just had to enlarge the incision uh, just a tiny bit, maybe around 4 to 4.5 mm from the original 2.8 mm to get these fragments out.
Once the fragments are out, I use diluted triamcinolone acetate to confirm vitreous prolapse. Yes, vitreous disturbance is noted as it is highlighted by the staining of the triamcinolone acetate. Time to do by manual antivitrectomy. To begin with, I enter with my cutter alone and hold it at the level of the PC tear. And as soon as the cutting and aspiration is begun, the vitreous anterior to it is cut and aspirated into the probe. Now I introduce my irrigation cannula. Please note the bottle height as I begin the vitrectomy. It's kept very low initially because it contains already a lot of OVD there. So once the chamber begins to get evacuated of the OVD and the vitreous, the bottle light is then gradually increased. The idea is not to have sudden deepening of antechamber uh, when we enter with an infusion cannula with the bottle light very high. Once the anterior vitreous is removed, the cutter is rotated sideways and posteriorly to remove the surrounding prolapse vitreous. My aim is to perform just a limited anterior vitrectomy, that is, uh, just to remove only the prolapse vitreous. Once the vitreous is cleared, I switch to cortex extraction mode and I'm removing the cortex using the vitrector itself. It's a great tool to remove the vitreous as well as the cortex. We can switch between the two whenever we suspect that the vitreous is prolapsed. At this moment, I realize that the patient is uncomfortable and is complaining of pain. I remember, we are performing the surgery under topical anesthesia. So, I inject subconch lignocaine and make a small conjunctival opening in the inferior medial quadrant. And then, using 23G cannula, I inject 1 ml of lignocaine into the posterior subterranean space. This will ensure the patient's comfort and it won't bother us to do a tidy job here. Again, back with my cutter. There's a small chunk of lens matter in the subcapsular region under the rexis. It is gently manipulated into the antechamber and expressed out using OVD. There is still some amount of cortex which is remaining and which is aspirated out this time using the bimanual INDA. Now it looks clean. It's time to implant the lens now. I'm creating a space under the iris and above the anterior capsule with the help of sodium hyaluronate. I intend to place a multi-piece lens with its haptic in sulcus and optic being captured in the rexis. 
The distal haptic is gently dropped into the sulcus over the intercapsule and the other haptic is then dialed in so that the entire lens with the haptics are placed in the sulcus above the intercapsule. Now I go in with my vitrector posterior to the lens into the vitreous cavity to remove all the OVD which has seeped in during all these maneuvers. It takes a couple of minutes to clean up all the OVD behind the lens and also I am careful to aspirate all the viscoelastic which is sticking on to the posterior surface of the lens. So once we have a clean lens now, it's time to achieve optic capture. My left hand has the irrigation and the right hand has the lens dialer which is used to nudge the optic backwards until we see the ovalization of the rexus. The ovalization is confirmatory of the fact that the optic capture is successful. It is quite critical to achieve this optic capture as it will ensure that the lens will remain locked in and we can achieve excellent long term stability of the lens. Since the optic of the lens is behind the intercapsule, we don't have to change any refractive power of the lens. I usually use the same lens power which was scheduled for in the back placement. Before closing, one final check with triamcinolone acetate to confirm uh, the absence of any prolapsed vitreous. I prefer to suture the main incision as it was extended a little bit. I am using 10 o Vicryl for that. The side ports are hydrated. That's it. The case is done. This is the next day. The cornea is clear with no inflammation. We do have a happy patient. After two weeks, a dilated retinal evaluation is done, which is repeated after six weeks. The patient continues to do well. To summarize, expect uh, the intraoperative surprises when dealing with such unusual cataracts, especially in the young patients with the traumatic cataracts. We should be prepared to manage a pre-existing PC tear as was in this case. Even though some of them look like routine cataracts, I think it's imperative that we keep our retractor and a multi-piece IOL handy as they can be lifesavers for us in such situations. Thank you for your attention and hope this helps.